I mean, imagine what would happen if they were set free to start to compete under the rule of law and free trade and secure and safe property rights. It's a young population, it's a growing population. If it was set free and, and integrated into international trade and trade with the neighbors and, and in an African free trade area, all those things that you constantly talk about and peaceful cooperation with, with neighbors, I think that there is a chance that this would will be Africa century. Welcome to another IATP Explainer. This week we are joined by Johan Norberg. Johan is an author, lecturer, and documentary filmmaker. He is also a senior fellow at both the Cato Institute and the European Center for International Political Economy. Finally, Johan has been the author and editor of more than 20 books, which have been translated into more than 30 languages. What are the differences between open and closed societies? An open society is a society that's uh, open to new influences and to surprises. It's not planned from a blueprint top down. So it's open to influences often from abroad and new people, travelers, migrants, merchants, and trade exchange open to the technologies, goods and services coming in from other places, but also the ideas and uh, it the difference with, from, with a closed society is that that's already planned by someone at the top, the elites, a political committee, the parliament has already a plan for how people are supposed to live, how the economy is going to work out, what is going to be produced. It's all there. It's not open to the surprises that comes from trial and error, from feedback and adaptation, new experiments, which really means that closed societies limit themselves to the ideas from a few people at the top, whereas open societies are constantly open to new ideas and often surprising ones. In what ways do open societies have better outcomes than closed ones? Well, economically, it's it's a no-brainer. You can show that mathematically and intuitively that it makes sense that I write the books and my washing machine take care of, takes care of my uh, clothes. Uh, it's the same thing with people. If you're open to specialization, then you can specialize and accumulate more knowledge and more technological skill in what you're doing. And in exchange, you can get the best things that other people, others are, are doing for you. So that's why you can see historically that societies, when they begin to open up to exchange and to new ideas, new technologies, that's the moment in time when they begin to defeat poverty and hunger and start a rise from, from rags to riches. But it's actually even more subtle than that. It's more open societies are more culturally open it's open to new influences it's open to more innovation because all the great stuff that we've got our culture our innovations our technologies they're not the results of a plan they're the results of experiments by thousands and millions of people and then lots of trial and error lots of um, testing in markets and feedback and then you adapt what you're doing trying to make it a little bit better better and whether you're trying to invent the wheel or a personal computer or an ai chatbot you need that experimentation and all those surprises involved in a trial and error process. And that's why open societies always do better in the long run when it comes to innovation and building a thriving society. What would you say to critics who claim that greater free trade and foreign direct investment results in a race to the bottom, which ends up harming and exploiting workers? This is a theoretical possibility. It could be that... Uh, investments are always looking for the cheapest place to do business and uh, they want lower wages worse working conditions and then countries would start to um, to reduce uh, 
uh, labor standards. But uh, so it's an empirical question. Is this really happening? And then we see it's the complete opposite. What we've seen in the world in the year of globalization is that working standards are improving in most places. Workplaces are becoming safer. Wages are rising. And we've never had so few in extreme poverty and working poor as we do today. And that's because investors don't look for the cheapest or worst place to do business. They're looking for the most competitive place to do business. And that's often places where productivity is improving, where you have better technology, better infrastructure. So most investments actually go to fairly rich places. Unfortunately, and this is the other mistake with the race to the bottom hypothesis, when investments and exchange find their way to poor countries with bad working standards, their main effect is to improve those standards. Because what you do when you spread new technologies, new management ideas, is that you raise productivity, every worker can produce more than they used to, and then they can also earn more, get more total compensation in wages and in terms of working standards. And that's why we're seeing all around the world, in low and middle income countries, that um, urban businesses pay better than rural ones, uh, export businesses um, pay better than uh, the ones who produce for local markets, and foreign owned businesses and businesses that are part of global international supply chains pay much better than uh, domestic ones on average between 20 to 40 percent better. And that doesn't make the workers less competitive. It hands them better technologies and more opportunities to produce even more in the future. And hence it reduces poverty uh, even further. So what free trade does, what foreign direct investment does is that it doesn't create a race to the bottom. If anything, it's a race to the top. In what ways has Africa progressed in the last few decades? First of all, you can look at this economically domestic institutions. We've had a movement towards more stable macroeconomic frameworks. We haven't seen the uh, outrageous um, policies that really systematically destroyed uh, wealth creation and, and property rights in the last few decades, as we saw before. And growth has increased. The GDP per capita has grown by some 35 to 40 percent since the turn of the millennium, faster than the world as a whole. Uh, extreme poverty has decreased from almost 60% in the late 1990s to uh, around 35% today. So something is going on in Africa right now. But even more important than those economic indicators are indicators of, of human well-being. Um, and then you can see that even countries that don't have, haven't made much economic progress have made dramatic progress when it comes to living standards, uh, health, life expectancy. And this is due to globalization because they've opened up more to technologies, medicine, vaccination. Uh, all those things have come down in price because of, uh, of globalization. So since the turn of the millennium, life expectancy in Africa has increased by 10 years, 10 years in just a little more than 20 years, which means that, I mean, on average, every the average person can celebrate every birthday by just approaching death by six months, not 12 months. It's an astonishing development. And that's very much related to uh, the decline in child mortality. It's declined since the turn of the millennium by 60% in Africa, which means that uh, last year, one million fewer children died than in 2002. Uh, and that's millions and millions of children who get a longer education than ever before and grow up and get hopefully better life chances and opportunities than ever before. So something is happening in Africa. Are you optimistic about Africa's future? Being in the shanty towns in Kenya and South Africa and other places, and I've seen how remarkably hard people are working. The entrepreneurs in their tiny shops and shackles who work so desperately hard, 
trying to avoid all the corruption, all the red tape, all the harassment from police, from government, from unsecured property rights and stuff like that. I mean, imagine what would happen if they were set free to start to compete under the rule of law and free trade and secure and safe property rights. It's a young population. It's a growing population. If it was set free and, and integrated into international trade and trade with the neighbors and and in an African free trade area, all those things that you constantly talk about and peaceful cooperation with, with neighbors. I think that there is a chance that this would will be Africa century. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy this video, you may find some of our other work interesting. Check out another video here. Also, make sure to hit the like and subscribe button below, leave a comment and follow the IATP on Twitter at the underscore IATP.